America, America. All right, one to the two, two to the three, and the place to be. Welcome to the Impact Review here at the Impact Lounge. I am your host, BQ. I've also got Ro the Great in the place to be, and we're going to be talking Impact Wrestling just like we do each and every single week for the Impact Wrestling fans. Also, check out the Heel Cast. Big shout out to the Heel Cast. They shout me out, shout us out every single week when they do their impact reviews so don't hesitate to go check them out this episode of the impact lounge is brought to you by draft if you enjoy playing fantasy sports and you enjoy playing for money play draft.com slash bq is the place to be you could play for as little as a dollar against two other opponents winner take all might make a buck 80 but hey it's a good time Playdraft.com slash BQ is the place to be. Check it out. Free $3 game with your first deposit. All right, Ro. Another good episode of Impact Wrestling. This is two strong weeks in a row. Enjoyed it a lot. Enjoyed last week's a lot. I don't got a whole lot negative to say. There was there was some randomness to this episode. Some of it worked, some of it didn't. But I thought it was pretty good. First thing I want to talk about is the crowd there's been some people online saying they didn't like the crowd. That uh, I'm flabbergasted by the fact that after two episodes, people are saying they need to go back to the impact zone in Orlando. That blows my mind. But crowd, what well, we got to take into consideration, folks, that people do have lives. Bound for Glory was the previous night. You know, ended very late for them. They had the thing at Crescent Crate after long night, long day. Next few days after that, you got to be available from 7.30 p.m. Actually, uh, it's four-hour tapings now, they were saying. So, uh, yeah, I think that's – I'm doing my math here. I think it's 7.30 p.m. to 11.30 p.m. every single night. This particular episode was the second half of that, 9.30 p.m. to 11.30 p.m. Not everyone can be up late. So, of course, this is going to be a smaller crowd than what we saw last week. From what I understand, the crowd the next few nights is a lot better. I understand. I, I know that they paid a few people to fill spots and everything, but I've heard the crowd was a lot better. But I still, me personally, did not have any issues with this crowd. I still thought they were very engaged to what was going on. I could see them moving. I could see them. I could hear them chanting. To me, it was not dead. The only times there was that dead sound was the fact that, hey, there's 200 people in there. And that's that. There's just a natural silence that's going to happen at times because there's not really that many people in there. But I didn't think it was a bad reflection of um, how g- engaged they were and how into the show that they were. So, uh, what do you think about the crowd? I think the crowd's fine. Um, if anything, at least for me, um, and I'm starting to believe maybe it's an audio problem, but just it doesn't come across well received on the TV screen for me. Like. I'm watching and they look so engaged, but just the sound, um, that's just where it just has me. Cause when I was watching impact, I'm like, God, why does it sound like the crowd was flat? But then I'm looking and you know, everyone looks all engaged and whatnot. So I'm just of the mindset that they got to kind of get that audio, their audio problem kind of fixed, or at least, at least that's what, how I'm taking it. I don't know if you feel that same way. Yeah. I've been feeling that way for a while. Uh, the bound for glory audio, they did a really bad job with the announcing was so loud. And when you heard the wrestlers come out the ring music or when you heard them screaming in the ring, you know, like um, yelling out something, you couldn't hear them at all. The the um, the uh, the uh, audio of the announcing was so much louder. But this particular episode, it was late at night. It was a night after Bound for Glory. And after they've already been there for a couple hours, it's a, it's a little hard to keep that energy up. And that's something that's always going to plague the episodes is the amount of energy when people are there all night. I was there for the Bound for Glory episode or the uh, episode after Bound for Glory last year. And it was really similar. It was by far the smallest crowd I've ever seen in the impact zone. They actually had to start about 30 minutes later, um, you know, hoping some more people would, would trickle in. And I mean, I turned to my wife, I was like, this, this is it. You know, it was, it was actually pretty embarrassing. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the cameramen with impact, they have no shame 
in showing the empty parts of the arena. I, I, I don't get that at all. Um, watching Hollywood Championship Wrestling, where you know I was watching Nick Aldis and Tim Storm, uh, the NWA World Title match, like they've probably got a hundred, hundred fifty people in there at the most. You know, they they set up the audience much like the Impact Zone does, but there's no one on the sides or you know, but their camera is not zooming around on the parts where no one is sitting. So I don't know why they do this. It's really unnecessary. Um, as a matter of fact, like the NXT crowds are usually, I think in a full sale, I understood it was always about 400, 450, which is a larger crowd than the impact zone, but it's not, it's not like a packed arena. The non-camera side, there's nobody there at all. And, but for some reason, those pictures never surface online like they do, like the impact ones do. But their cameras focus on where the people are sitting. So something I don't really understand that they do. But I think record uh, doing TV the night after Bound for Glory, I just don't think it's a night that people want to go and, and watch wrestling after being there late. I mean, I, I know when I was there for Bound for Glory last year, and then I you know tell my wife and kids, hey, we're going right back the next day. You know, they're tired. So, yeah, uh, enough about the crowd. Um, but the... Uh, Episode of Impact, really good. Kicked it off with a six-way, six six-man, X-Division tag team match. Trevor Lee, Caleb Conley, and Ishimori versus Desmond Xavier, Sanjay Dutt, and Garza Jr. Very random, the inclusion of Ishimori. No explanation. Came down slapping, fans, slapping hands like a baby face. Wrestled with the heels. Uh, or wrestled like a heel for the most part. Desmond Xavier looked great. Sanjay was just kind of there. Uh, Garza Jr., I liked when he came down with the little doll and gave it to the kid. I think that's something that could really work for him. Um, what you, what do you got on this uh, X Division six man tag? Yeah, I found it to be quite random. Um, the first uh, issue I had with it, you know, albeit minor, was Impact only has a few stables. You know, we see now with uh, OVE with the addition of Callahan, LAX, and then um, the Cult of Lee. And I thought this was would have been a better, a, a good opportunity to utilize the Code of Lee having Everett included in this match as opposed to Ishimori. But um, yeah, um, as far as the match, it's fine. I just kind of feel like it's one of those thrown together uh, X Division matches that you know we get time and time again. And having Ishimori, you know, be a part of the hillside didn't make much sense. You know, seeing that he. They've uh, talked about him, you know, potentially challenge for the X Division title. And I know there were some minor miscues in the match, so that kind of played it up a little bit. But um, if anything, my biggest takeaway from this match was um, Impact reestablishing uh, Desmond Xavier. Because Desmond Xavier lost a lot of momentum after he won that Super X Cup. So I thought this was a great way for them to re reintroduce him. And it looks like moving forward that uh, he's going to get a proper push. Yes. Um, what the, one thing that I don't like when it comes to, we would talk about the randomness of the X Division all the time. Trevor Lee is always on the losing side of every match. Unless he's defending the X Division championship, he is on the losing side. That's something I really don't care for. It's like every time we have a tag match with the X Division, it's where we're pushing the baby faces. We're trying to get the baby faces over, but just the, you know, the heel side is unable to generate any kind of heat. I mean, whether he's tagging with Conley or Conley and Everett, they just lose every time. Conley usually takes the fall. And I'm a big Caleb Conley fan, but it's, I just feel like every time you see him in a match, you know that's the guy getting pinned. So there's not a lot of excitement when it comes to that. The match itself was was excellent um, for for the amount of time it got. And um, it's it just time to man, just buckle down with this X Division. And, I mean, they're doing great with the wrestling. I mean, think where the X Division was last year. You know, not even close to this. But, you know, let's let's get some let's get some kind of storylines going here, like something. But this is just something where the, the announced team... We talked about this before. You've brought this up. The announced team could put stuff over, you know, make some kind of sense of the Ishimori thing. Sometimes they do, but they come up with some, you know, like when we had that... Uh, X Division match before Bound for Glory, and they're like, yeah, Trevor Lee uh, requested this match where he could get his ass kicked by five people so he could scout them <laughs> out. <laughs> right. Yeah, you know, so, uh, you know, uh, 
Now, let me ask you, um, as far as with Garza, um, is he really injured or are they trying to play up? Is that kind of kind of his gimmick at the moment right now? No, I think I think he's injured. Um, if it was a gimmick, he'd be like bandaged up like the like those silly wraps they put around the stomach when they have rib, rib injuries and things like that. He's wearing a KT tape, which I, I wear that on my shins when I run. And uh, that's that's pretty legit for injury. So um, I would say it's probably I, I would say there's probably some truth to it, but he's he's probably, you know, playing off it a little bit as he should. I've seen lots of wrestlers in my years that are bandaged up because of real injuries and then they get out there and it doesn't you know, they don't play it play up to it. So. Yeah, it just looks like he looks so compromised. And, you know, when I was, you know, watching this match, you know, first thing I was thinking was, and I was thinking back of, I don't know if you remember, this is way back, but when uh, Orton, it was part of his uh, heel turn, he had injured his shoulder. And, you know, he kept kind of like milking it, milking it, milking it. And he was a baby face at the time, but, you know, he transitioned to heel. And I thought maybe were they trying to go that way with him? But I'm watching Garza wrestle and he looks so compromised. But with that said, too, isn't it amazing um, leading up to Bound for Glory? They had him mixing it up in the main event. And then once they threw him in that multi-man X Division match, now, you know, he's uh, X back to being an X Division guy. Right, with no kind of... Uh main event um feel to him at all whatsoever it's, it's like crazy. you come out of that main event scene you think maybe he'd be getting the the pinfall or no nothing so i it's like i told you guys i really think they threw him into the um the low key sl slot and now after Bamford glory he's going back to where they projected him so i don't, I, I don't know next match of the evening one of the most random matches in impact history in my opinion EC3 defends the glo the uh, sorry the the uh, Impact Grand Championship versus Fala Ba. I had so many mixed emotions about this row. Like I was watching it, and one minute I wasn't sure if I liked it or if I didn't like it, or if I was enjoying it, enjoying it or not enjoying it. Because there were so many parts that I did like, and then there were some you know other things that I didn't care for. Overall, I did kind of like it because if you're talking about the quality of a grand championship match. This probably was one of the better ones, in my opinion, um, in, in a while, um, that featured a mid-card act. So I'm not talking about Galloway versus Moose or uh, Moose versus EC3 or anything like that. Um, you know, for follow by being a mid-card guy, last time we saw a mid-card guy challenge, it was Marche Rocket, and he lost the first round and they got pinned in the second round. So follow by really held his own. I felt like he got a lot of offense in there on arguably one of the greatest talents in Impact history <laughs> in EC3. And this was a guy at Falaba wasn't built up at all. He is, every time he's gone out there, it's been a you know tag team match, comedy act, um, quick quick loss. So that was just one thing I was, I was kind of like, what, what was the point of this match? But I kind of liked it at the same time. Thought EC3 should have got, got. I mean, EC3 lost the first round. So, what were your thoughts on this one on the the Grand Championship? When I seen the match originally advertised, you know, like I'm sure many, I thought, wow, pretty random. But hey, you get an EC3, he's the champion, and you know, I can't recall the last time he really defended the Grand Championship. And you know, with Fala by the way I took it is, hey, you know what? This is a guy, you know, previously had been um you know used as comedic relief so you know maybe they're uh taking it turning the page with him and giving him an opportunity and i'm all for that but it this match it was just too much comedy for me like i thought this could have been a good way to make follow bar kind of you know that monster you know whatever we see with you know the heavier guys but he was too much of a comedy character and i felt like it dragged ec3 down to that you know comedy character and then in the end to have EC3 win, like, and I'm not trying to say Falaba isn't, you know, is a nobody, but, you know, you could have had EC3 cheat and, you know, hit his finisher and win, but to use the ropes, it just didn't make any sense. And then there really was no follow-up. I was looking for EC3 to cut a promo, you know, following up as far as with Sidel or something to to let us know that that his inter interaction with Sidel last impact 
wasn't just a one off and we didn't get that. So, I mean, it was OK. Um, I'm happy to see follow ball, you know, them doing something with follow ball. Hopefully they follow up. I mean, he'd be good, you know, for the mid card that they need to establish. But, yeah, it was just kind of just. Eh. I, I, I agree. I would have liked to see Matt Seidel come out there. I know people hate when I use WWE references. I remember a couple years ago on NXT, there was a feud between Baron Corbin and, um, oh my God, what the hell was his name? Bull, Bull, uh, Bull Dempsey. And at the time, they were both very dominant wrestlers. And what happened to build up their storyline is that when Bull Dempsey was wrestling, Baron Corbin would come out and kind of scout the match, not say a word. And then when Baron Corbin was wrestling, Bull Dempsey would come out, watch his match, not say a word. Then finally it was like, finally it was like are we going to do this or not? And they were like the two monsters of the company at the time. So I'm not saying something like that, but you could actually build a storyline where, you know, EC3 came out after that side out win. Side out comes out after the EC3 win, says a few things. Kind of some back and forth jabs in that sense. Um, and then eventually lead to, okay, if you can do better, show me, let's do this. Let's put the title on the line, you know? So kind of, uh, I, I agree with you. I would have liked to see Seidel come out there, but he didn't. EC3 cheats the win. Probably didn't need to. I agree with you. He should have hit, you know, maybe hit the one percenter after he um, ran into the turnbuckles, but is what it is. You know, they did show Falaba in the ring afterwards looking very upset which usually usually those little tiny details shows okay this is someone we kind of care about it wasn't like after he lost the camera was never shown on him again he rolled out of the ring and he was just a jobber so uh, this is a uh, kind of breaking news that just came out this morning i'm not familiar with this guy um, i'm gonna get familiar with him real quick british born punjabi wrestler tony cage has announced on twitter that he has signed with impact wrestling um, I checked his Twitter, and I was already following this guy, so apparently I'm, I'm probably more familiar with him than I realize. There's just so many uh, wrestlers out there <laughs> to, mm -hmm. uh, to uh, you know, follow everyone. But um, I definitely look into this guy, Tony Cage, um, based off his picture. Kind of looks like an X-Division guy. Um, you know, and, and recently they got rid of Shira, and I, I, was, I was not really understanding that with the connection to India. But obviously they got Sanjay and... You know, maybe this was the guy that we're, we're, you know, going to try to make into a star because there's only so much you can do with Mahabali Shira. So we'll see what happens going forward with Tony Cage. Next match of the evening, a good one, LAX versus OVE. I don't like that they say it's LAX with Homicide against OVE with Sammy Callahan. It's LAX versus OVE. They're, they're groups, they're stables, they're teams. We've talked about this before, Ro. Sammy Callahan has added something to these guys and make them interesting now. I was watching an interview with them um, on YouTube this morning after I woke up. And I couldn't even listen to it because it was, it was kind of an interview with Sammy Callahan. And OBE kept butting in. And they're just not even close to this dude when it comes to talking. And, every, and I just got so tired of them talking that I, I shut it off. And um, Sammy Callahan adds something I think I said Callahan. Callahan adds something really special to this team. I really liked the promo where they were backstage, um, kind of S.H.I.E.L.D. esque, you know, un undisclosed location. I, I believe that gimmick, you know, because it looked like it was being broadcast, you know, it was a little bit of, little bit of fuzz, a little bit of ch. I believe that was his vision for his NXT character once upon a time. I was reading an interview. He was supposed to be like a hacker, sort of, and uh, they didn't they didn't play that up with him. You know, he he debuted and then they turned him to a jobber real quickly. But he had said in an interview and he was kind of supposed to be a, a hacker that that you know his promos and stuff could interrupt um, other things going on with the show and things like that. So I kind of got that feeling. Maybe that's where they're going with it a little bit with that promo. That being said, this match was really good. Last time we saw Homicide wrestler, wrestle, he jobbed out to El Patron in about five seconds. So what did you think about this match? Um, and did you feel like, you know, because LAX now is being portrayed as the babyface. There was the double turn. OBE's the heel, the heel side. You know, did LAX, did that work out as a babyface? And what did you think about the overall match? 
Um, as far as the match, I thought it was fine. I think this was one of the instances that you could have done a no contest or a DQ finish and it would have been fine. Um, yeah, they're both playing their roles well. Um, LAX, you know, being the de facto faces, but not really kind of like, you know, we see slapping hands with the fans and whatnot. Um, the one thing I'll say, man, um, with all the turmoil this company's had this this year, this feud by far has been the best feud that the company's had. And it's amazing that, you know, this all stemmed from them putting the titles on OVE, hoping OVE would be the top babyface uh, tag team, and it didn't go over well. Then they do the double turn at Bound for Glory, you know, with the inclusion of um, Sammy Callahan. And then next thing you know, I mean, it's probably you know the hottest thing the company has going and um but yeah as far as the match um so you must continue i'm looking forward to see what these guys do next i am too and i could continue to watch these guys i think most of us didn't care for the feud off at front i mean uh i don't know what i just said um off the bat when ove was those um baby faces that they were trying to Kind of shoved down our throat for a little bit at least impact kind of listened you know kept their ear to the streets a little so this isn't working so they did a double turn i think that's gonna work because i think people i think a lot of people either feel nothing for them or dislike them so i think that they're really gonna shine in the heel role so i'm excited for it i'm excited to see them going forward and i think as you said this is one of the big best things they've had going in a while and even though they're the only tag teams and from what I, I, I don't look too, you know, into the spoilers, but I'm not under the impression that they introduce any other tag teams. And instead of tapings, seems like they're kind of hitching the wagon to these guys for a while. And I think they can get away with it. There's obviously a shelf life, but I think they can get away with it for now. Lots of good stuff going on there. Dan Lambert cuts a promo in the ring with American top team. Amazing. Once again, could listen to this guy all day. He, what a great heel promo this guy is. He gets it. And I think so many heels in wrestling don't get it. This guy gets it. He really was generating heat. He was getting a response from the audience. He tends to go on a little long, but I can listen to it. Like he's, It's not like I'm like, shut up. Um, he, 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 just, he just really gets how to, how to cut a promo. And um, after everything he's doing, Moose came down. I don't even remember Moose being there. After, you know, aside from the little bit he was talking because James Storm came down and cut an uh, amazing baby face promo, which I can't believe I'm even, even saying those words. We've talked before. I've told you about I had issues with the Drew Galloway baby face promos because he would just come out there and say this vanilla uh, white bread <laughs> stuff every week. And it was just out, out of the playbook of baby faces. And I, 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 you know, maybe it's kind of hard to cut a baby face promo these days. I, I don't know. I'm not in the industry like that. But Storm came out there, delivered this, nailed it. It was all about Storm, all about Dan Lambert. I don't even remember Lashley and Moose being there for the most part. Uh, what do you got on this? Um, as far as Dan Lambert's promo, he's always a good promo. So when he comes out, like, I'm always interested to hear what he has to say. But now with America top team, you know, I'm at the point, you know, they really proved what they wanted to prove at Bound for Glory. So really what's next? And to have Moose continue to feud with them, you know, where it's unfortunate because, you know, Moose, Moose is one of their stars or, you know, it has the potential to be one of their stars. And he seems to always be on the losing end of anything that involves Lashley, including this. So having James Storm included, it kind of seemed to me, and the James Storm promo was just fantastic. But, you know, having James Storm in is just like, okay, Moose is just, you know, rotating uh, partners, out goes Bonner, in comes Storm. And, you know, we already, you know, know that Storm's going to be leaving the company, I uh, want to say the end of the year or the end of these tapings. And if this is his farewell tour, um, I, I'm sad by it because I feel like there's so much more you could do. I mean, I'll, I would have loved to see him go the Kurt Angle route when Kurt Angle was leaving Impact, where he had a list of guys that he wanted to face and he's putting guys over, you know, guys that, you know, we had thought were going to be the future of the company. And I think that would have been better uh, served to use a James Storm to that capacity versus, you know, putting him in this feud 
I agree. I never really thought about that. Rewinding back a couple years, you know, the Kurt Angle farewell tour was pretty cool. But all I really did was really put over Lashley. Um, as far as, you know, Lashley took that ball and ran with it ever since then. You know, he also had a match with Bobby Roode that he won. He beat Galloway, lost to Galloway. Galloway's not around anymore. Roode's not around anymore. Um, I think he, I want to say he wrestled Davey Richards. Or, no, I think there was something where he, oh, he passed on the ankle locked at Davey Richards. That's what it was. But there was one other match he had in there. I don't remember who it was. But maybe they didn't feel like the current roster has the talent to do that with. You know, very possible. They were a little deeper in main event talent at the time when Angle was around. So that would have been cool. Um, I don't know that I'm, I'm interested to see what happens here in, in the next couple of weeks. I mean, I already have a general idea because uh, Ryan Satin. Um, but I, I can't wait to see. Stor Storm did a really good job. Lambert did a good job. And, uh, you know, oh man, you know what? To rewind here one second, because I totally forgot to bring this up. Did you see when in LAX versus OVE when... LAX threw the, the chair over the top rope to the outside and it hit Sammy Callahan and he fell. Yeah, I, man, you know what? <laughs> a part of me, I'm all like, was that planned or like, did he, did that Hell happen? No. He just fell, man. It was crazy. I thought that was hilarious. There was, no, I think that was totally on the fly. He threw it. It just so happened to come right at him and he just oversold it in the most hilarious way. That was, I, I thought that was hilarious. I was dying when I saw that. I think it was totally off the cuff. Like it just, they just ran with it in the moment. Funny ish. Um, so going back to American top team, um, as, as you said, they've kind of accomplished what they wanted to, but you know, I, I don't have a problem with longer storylines. And, uh, sometimes the general idea of a storyline seems to stop after the match happened, but there's, there's more they can do with this. Like Dan Lambert, American Top Team and Lashley, they, they can feud with more people. But I, I'm kind of having a hard time with, you know, they're saying, okay, we want Lashley out of his contract now. So I, I don't really know what's happening with that exactly. You know, I would think like a Lashley and Storm match would make a whole lot of sense, but I, I'm not really, I, I don't really get it right now what they're trying to do, but I'm locked in and engaged. Backstage, KM approach American top team. I think Dan Lambert told him to get out of there. And he said, KM was saying he likes what they're doing that he wants in. And at first I thought that they were just going to treat him like a jobber, whip his ass, push him away, something. And Lashley actually spoke to this guy. And, um, Lashley doesn't strike me as someone who, who speak, who's, you know, anyone's worthy of speaking to him, um, as far as a character goes. And he said, prove yourself. So, that's like a little tiny segment, but it seems like something they might run with, with KM, give him something to do. What do you got on this? Yeah, I like this only if if his association with them or if he's going to be running with them, I don't want him to be used as a lackey. You know, give this man an opportunity. I mean, you know, the one thing I love about KM, have you seen some of the moves this guy does? Yeah. I mean, for, oh, yeah. for, a big, for a big dude, man, he's really innovative. So... I think if you have KM part a part, and when I'm saying a part, you know, just in association with America's top team, at least somebody's getting some kind of rub, you know, being a part of any type of angle with him. Because that's the biggest problem I'm having with the America top team. You know, if you have the feud continue with Moose, who's getting the rub? Like Mo Moose isn't getting no rub. You know, they America top team has been dominant through the whole thing. So at least if you're including Cam, he's getting some of that rub. So I'm fine with that. So I want to see what they do moving forward. But, you know, I'm just hoping he's not used as a wacky. I agree with you. Don't use him as some kind of comedy element to the team. They already got a comedy, the little the little skinny guy with that neck brace. I think he's like a manager or something like that. I thought he was one of the fighters, and I'm like, I, I'm pretty sure I could beat him. <laughs> right. <laughs> but but he's been able to take some bumps and everything. So, so who knows? Um yeah, I like KM a lot, and as you, I think he has a really good move set. When he debuted against Braxton Sutter, I was like, "Man, we got a we got a main event heel here," and then he started kind of adding a lot of comedy to what he did, and to an extent, it works. You know, don't call me a liar and everything. That's fine. 
have comedy to you, but when you get to the ring, it should be taken serious. I've used the example of like Doink the Clown. The dude was a clown, dressed up like a clown, did clown things, but when he got in the ring, he wrestled. That's that's something I really think guys like Falaba, KM, need to tap into that a little bit. You you can you can do funny things, but when it comes to competing, it should be a little more serious. And I think that little edge would help a lot of guys. Curious to see what happens with that because it gives Cam something to do. And I really feel like they got to distance him from Sienna a little bit because I think that comedy side hurts her. Gail Kim had her retirement speech in the ring. The crazy thing is, Ro, there was like 45 minutes here without wrestling. And it worked. I was engaged. It wasn't like, oh my God, where's the matches? Stop talking. Everything was, it, it was great. Gail Kim did her retirement speech. At first, I didn't understand the inclusion of Ali. I think there was probably some real life implications there that they're close in real life and she wanted to be out there. Um, it would have been nice, you know, if they were in Orlando and had the full knockouts roster to where the babyface knockouts could have come out at the end. But with the current structure of the knockouts division and the location, not something they could do. But this was really, really nice and emotional. It wasn't too terribly long. It wasn't overbooked. They didn't use it as an opportunity for Sienna to come down and, and um, put herself over or to interrupt or, you know, something silly like that. They, they let it be what it was. She said what she had to say. What do you think about Gail? Yeah, before I uh, give my take, uh, yeah, I thought um, Allie coming out and just kind of just standing there is completely random but um at first i in in uh, as i watched the um you know i heard gail speak because i was i was of the mindset you know it would have been nice if she could have put someone over on her way out now i don't know if you know her because i know she has um back issues or whatever some type of injury um but yeah i thought it was well i mean you know this you know gail has been the person to really um change you know pave the way for women's wrestling as it pertains to impact because if you follow this company in the earlier days um that was really never a point of emphasis but you know the thing that i love about her relinquishing the title is this gives them an opportunity in this knockouts tournament to reestablish some of their knockouts that they haven't been focusing on i mean the one person that comes to mind would be lvn you know, after, you know, she started the whole Bridezilla and, you know, getting married to Grado, you know, she really got lost in the shuffle. So this really gives her, I think she'll benefit the most from this opportunity to be reestablished, as well as, you know, some of the newer knockouts. This gives them some TV time to compete. You know, they might not be competitive in the matches, but it gives the audience, you know, introduces the audience to some of these new knockouts, you know, knockouts of the future. So, yeah, but... um. You know, thanks, Gail Kim. Um, I appreciate, you know, what she did in the ring and seeing her. Some of her good, best matches in Impact, um, main eventing Impact. I mean, it's incredible. I hate to see her go, but now it's time for, you know, somebody else to step up, take the mantle. I agree. You know, I was watching her speak, and, and I was just so impressed by the way she still can move in the ring. And, you know, she's a beautiful woman, just uh, a legend. And um, I think... Her relinquishing the title was the right thing to do because they've really struggled on how to incorporate newer knockouts into the um, the stories and everything. You saw, you know, MJ was the biggest casualty of that. And um, I think this is a good idea because they're going to be doing a tournament. You can a very easy way to introduce new girls, and it's going to be very telling who the last couple knockouts are fighting for this title. It's going to, you know, be telling on who they're pushing on the heel side. And who they think the baby face is going forward. I personally think with Allie's inclusion into this angle. That they're ready to start hitching the wagon on her a little bit. May need to tweak the character a little. But I feel like they're going to move forward with Allie in a very positive direction here. Um, and there's you, you can always fall back on Rosemary when you need her. But it, it this is an exciting time for the division. And you know that also Allie sent a tweet out that you know. We're going to make this division the best one in the world. It looks kind of like she's ready to be a leader and step forward. Um, God, what was I just saying before that? Uh, You're talking about Gail 
as far as uh, you know, still being able to move in the ring. Oh yeah, but actually, I was going back to Gale. That I, I really think this is an exciting time for the knockouts because they've fallen back on Gale Kim so much. When they need someone in the main event, they need a surprise opponent. They need, a, you know, a champion. It's always like we fall back on Gail Kim, Gail Kim, Gail Kim, Gail Kim. Now they cannot do that anymore, so they're forced to use their heads and be creative. So it's an exciting time to be, to be a fan of the knockouts division. Really quick here, this was this was um, Joseph Park backstage, apologizing to Grado, gave him the visa back, which defeated the purpose of uh, the match for Bound for Glory. But then the Mountie came and and uh, deported him from Canada. So we'll see what happens going forward. You know, a, a bunch of um, local guys were in there with Braxton Stutter. So <laughs> I feel like I feel like you know they're including Braxton Stutter in there after the dirt sheets reported he wasn't <laughs> going to be at the tapings. Um, do you got anything on this on this at all? Um, I'm just making a bold prediction. They're going to end up, Grado and jo Joseph Parker are going to end up forming a tag team and probably somewhere down the road win the tag titles. Hmm. I can't say I can see it. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, well, at least at least them teaming up yeah. because, you know what, for, for this to keep continuing, I, I just feel like that's kind of the end game. And they do need tag teams. And, I mean, where else are you going to really use Grado? Is it going to hurt, you know, for him to team up with Joseph Park and at least – you know, challenge for the titles, but that's just my bold prediction. I got you. I can't say I'd be a fan of of, of that happening, them winning the straps, but <laughs> I could, uh, <laughs> you know, I could see it. This looks like they're trying to, to write the Abyss character off TV as well. So we'll see what happens going forward, but this is a storyline that's been very confusing uh, for the most part. Not something I think people care about a whole lot either, so it's not, you know, not good or bad either way. Jimmy Jacobs came out to do commentary. Keeps saying, "What do you What are you doing here?" And I don't think he's going to be a a wrestler. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if he does wrestle, but he's not a guy you can just throw in the X division like you do these other guys. Like he he would need some story to him. Um, I was actually going to catch him this weekend at Wrestle Circus, but they canceled the event. Uh, I forgot who his opponent was, but it was man. They canceled that event. I was a few hours away from it. It was like Zack Saber Jr. against Andrew Everett. Uh, Laurel Van Ness versus uh, Tessa Blanchard. I mean, this this card was killing it, and they canceled the event. Um, but going back to it, I like him on commentary a lot. I think he had something very, very special to it. I could I could listen to him being in there full time if they went to the, back to the three man booth thing. He could actually, if if it was a two man booth and he was just that heel commentator, I think he'd be tremendous. From what I understand, he has a very creative mind, was responsible for, in the past year or two, some of the really popular angles, creative angles in WWE. I understood he was fired because he took a picture with the Bullet Club when they um, invaded Raw. And I saw the picture online where he, and I understood that's why he was let go. I don't, I don't know, you know, the truth of that. I really haven't followed much regarding him in that sense. I have an idea what he's going to do because someone posted a picture on Facebook, um, and I kind of like it if that's if it's what I'm what I'm thinking based off the picture. But uh, I really added liked what he added. The main event of the evening was Eli Drake versus Petey Williams. You know they, they don't have a challenger for Eli Drake at the moment. Where it, it, the main is the main event scene right now is three people, the other two are feuding, and we got a break from those guys this week. Usually when they say they're banned from the building, they show up anyway. So they were banned. We kind of got a break from them. Got to just focus on Eli Drake, which we haven't been able to do in a little while. And this match was strictly done as, you know, something special for Petey Williams to do. Utilize, the, you know, the positive reaction of Petey Williams against Eli Drake to start building that credible heel heat. And, you know, the, he got... He got a lot of, um, I don't want to say he got a lot of offense, but he got a lot of some near falls in there. And he gave, he had, there was moments where he gave the crowd hope that he was going to win. Hit the Canadian Destroyer, Eli Drake, first person to kick out. I thought this main event was so good. I think it was everything it needed to be. We didn't get a whole bunch of Chris Adonis. And as I've, I've said before, I said it last week, it's okay to cheat when you're the heel, but you got to beat the people you're supposed to beat. And, uh, 
like EC3 in his match. You're, you're supposed to beat Falaba, so you shouldn't necessarily have to cheat. They've been doing that with Eli Drake, where he's getting a lot of victories by cheating. This is one Eli Drake, on paper, should win. And, you know, they did a lot of teasing of the Destroyer, a lot of teasing of the Gravy Train. It was just a great main event. What do you think? Yeah, well, what made this great for me was the story behind it, you know, at least for, in my eyes, was, you know, will PD be able to hit the Destroyer? Because, you know, PD's a smaller guy. I mean, we know we see him as an X Division guy, but, you know, he's a small X Division guy. And what they did, and that's why I have confidence with uh, Creative, is if they want to make a guy seem credible, even if it's a guy that we've seen, uh, you know, being misutilized, they can. They made PD really look credible in this match where, you know, he looked like he could hang with the world champ, you know, while not making Eli Drake look weak. I mean, Eli was able to look dominant. And I thought it was cool, you know, the the uh, teasing of the Destroyer, of the Gravy Train. And then when he finally hits it, you know, as a fan, you're thinking, like, that's it. But then to have Eli kick out and then PD goes for it again and then ultimately it's reversed into the Gravy Train, which was a nice reversal on Eli's end. Like... I really just thought moving forward, like they they need they should take chances. It's not gonna hurt them. You know, instead of always trying to go back and trying to get an outsider, utilize what you have. You know, you can fall into something. And the best thing about this match is not only Eli got to, you know, retain, but he closed out the show raising the title. Cause I think if you would have had El Patron and Impact. On this card, they would have closed out some kind of, you know, promo. And we don't need that. The champion should be closing out the show. Absolutely. Totally agree. This is something I was, I had a big problem with in the Bound for Glory build. That they weren't showing us they had confidence in Eli Drake. And with this episode, it looks like they had confidence. Did they, um, did they announce anything for next week yet? Uh, not, not, not that I, I can remember. I mean, they do a good job on Twitter. <laughs> I mean, anyways, so <laughs> yeah. you just wait, they'll, they'll talk about it, they, I'm sure. They need to do a better job of doing it on TV because their Twitter following is not a, not their strongest following. I don't have Instagram. Um, I know a lot of more people use Instagram, so I'm sure that's helpful. And then, um, you know, they have a big fo Facebook following, but there's a lot of haters on there, too, that still like the page that, you know, used to follow the company and now they're just there to troll. You know, so I, I wish they would do more promotion on the on the show um, next week. We got this coming up. I know when I used to when I was a kid watching WCW and WWF, you know, they'd be like next week. So and so in action, you know, it, it would make me want. OK, I want to turn the TV on that. I want to make sure I don't miss that. Um, you know, so, but yeah, overall really good episode and, uh, let, let's hope we're, it's going to be interesting to see what happens with the next one. I've been told the crowd was, was larger and it also features the people that were paid to be there. From what I understand, it was about a hundred people total over the three nights. You know, I don't, it's by no means, you know, of course, um, you know, these dirt sheets and these clowns like the Solomons are going to make, you know, play it up that they pay the whole entire audience and things like that. You know, it's they were plugging holes and they were doing something that people do in the entertainment industry. It's just that it works against impact a little bit. Um, you know, it would it would have been nice to just do a set of tapings, have good showings and, and just be what it was. Because, you know, when they were in India, they were accused of paying people there, too. Um, yeah, you got, you got, uh, any closing thoughts on, uh, on the show or just the company in general? Yeah. Um, and I have a question too. Um, as far as the show, I found it to be good. Um, I kind of feel if they keep their, the pace that they're going, you know, just simple, simple booking, you know, not, not too much, too much randomness and, you know, overbooking, I think we're due for, a breakout impact to close out the year and I, I really am hoping that we get that you know the one episode where it's like wow you know to end the year on a good note because so much has happened this year I think us fans you know we deserve that and, and the wrestlers deserve it as well too so yeah good episode but I wanted to ask you and this is just in re into regards with EC3 now 
you know, we, you know, it's been debatable as far as with the grand championship, but, you know, I know you've mentioned that it doesn't mean anything to him. And, you know, one would argue that the way, way that they've used him, it's, it's kind of been creative's fault. But do you feel that he took winning the grand championship as a demotion more so than creative kind of failing him? Because I you know, I was of the mindset, him winning it, you know, being EC3 multi-time uh, world champion, that he would elevate the Grand Championship to astron- astronomical levels, you know, because we saw Moose with it, and, you know, Moose did well with it, and I felt like it elevated him to the main event scene, you know, before he started the America Top Team feud. But, um, yeah, you know, I look at with EC3, and then even with the new regimes, and, I mean... I've always looked at him as, you know, he he benefited the most from the, the Carter regime. I mean, hell, he still has Carter in his name. So, and I know you were talking about you predicted that maybe he might be departing. Now, that would suck, but I wouldn't be too mad just for the simple fact that he wasn't misutilized. I mean, this man, he had two title reigns. He went undefeated for a year. But um, I guess my, my main thing is, do you think you know, when they decided to put the grand championship on him, that he took it like, really? And like, because there's at times I see him, he do, he comes across as disengaged on my TV screen. W- what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think he did a little bit because that title means nothing. I think he knows it means nothing. And if they were to have a conversation with, hey, you're going to you're gonna carry this title. Um, and if, if you remember, I, I don't even, I know your son watches the other product. I remember uh, years ago, John Cena held a U.S. title to give it, to put it back to where it needed to be. And it's possible that they had a conversation like that with ECE where you're going to hold this mid-card title and you're, you're going to elevate it to where it needs to be. That has not happened at all. He's probably been the worst champion of all of them um, just because he, he has no interest in the title, no interest in defending it. So... Um, I think he took it as one a little bit. I don't think this company knows what to do with him right now. It's a new company. This isn't TNA. This isn't the TNA roster. They've got rid of, in the last year, almost all the guys that they inherited. Um, It's not the same roster. So they're trying to go a different direction. I don't think EC3 fits the direction they want to go. For lack of a better term, he is their Cena. But he hasn't been booked like that for the last year and a half, two years. You know, he won the um, the world title and that, that long-ass tournament, um, lost it pretty shortly after, and has never held it again. He was in the title picture for a little while, had the match with Lashley last year, bound for glory. I don't think anyone expected him to win. And I don't think that they've known what to do with him for quite some time. I do not expect him to be in the company going forward. Um, I would hate that. As I'm talking about arguably my favorite wrestler in the company you know i say arguably because um there, there's a few people that i have on the same level um braxton sutter james storm ec3 there's a few people that i've um had right there in the mix you know it just kind of depends who's hot at the time who's in a storyline uh so this would be very difficult for me i don't think he's going and it would be in a company going forward he doesn't look happy doesn't sound happy doesn't tweet happy um i think he did take it as a bit of a demotion so yeah that's crazy though and to me that's kind of um it, it you know it makes me believe like if he's not in the world title picture then he's going to be unhappy and the one thing that i i loved ab- about eli drake and even if you remember when he was the king of the mountain champion this guy man they were showing the vignettes of him you know on the mountains with the belt like he, he's a proud champion and you know right now we see it now him being you know the impact global champion and you know we need some of the stars you know the main event guys to if they're trying to reestablish the mid card you know who better than a top guy and it's just really disappointing because i thought you know when ec3 winning winning it i was like oh wow you know we're gonna get to see it defended often because we always see ec3 and you know whoever beats him that's gonna be a huge rub and then you could always have ec3 you know, um, compete for the uh, Impact Global Championship again. But, you know, to have him kind of just take it as a demotion and it doesn't mean anything. And like I said, I do blame creative too because 
you know, they inherited this championship from the Corgan era. And it was like, if you didn't believe in it, you should have dropped it then. I feel like they're too far ahead now where you scrap it and you're going to start all over again. Or if you do a name change, you know, it's just, it's just bad, you know, knowing this company's history with mid-card uh, championships. But, um, yeah, it, it was just one thing, one thing that it just came to my mind because I was just like, man, you know, like he should be doing so much more. And like, you know, he does seems like it's a whatever belt to him. So, yeah. I, I I really wish they would experiment with EC3 and Eli Drake almost forming a partnership. I think it would be one of the biggest things in wrestling. I think it would be so over just the mic skills and the and the and the creative and and uh, I, I think it would be amazing. But wrestling just doesn't do that anymore. They don't they do not pull the trigger on on pairing up. You know, top guys. Uh, the stables are always I say always about ninety percent of the time the star and a jobber or the star and the jobbers it's 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 very rare that you see a group or a team um i, I shouldn't say a team I'm, I'm using a term stable even if it's a two-man funk you know kind of like a uh, adonis and drake where they're on the same level that's very very rare it's something that i think really worked back in you know i think that's one of the things that made you know the attitude era what it was is they had so many groups so many stables but it's like you didn't want to face any of those guys or you knew that any anyone across the ring from you in that group was going to be a challenge. And TNA put some really good stables together as well. So I, I feel like it's in their DNA to do it. But the roster is kind of small right now. Got rid of a lot of people. You know, they're, they're counting on talent from AAA and Noah. And um, I say Crash. They, they just use Crash as a promotion to go wrestle at. You know, Garza's the only Crash guy. But they're using talent from other places, and I don't think they're currently constructed to put together stables, but it's something I think they should do. So, All right, that's going to do it for our Impact review this week. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Thank you very much for listening. Hope you are a subscriber on whatever platform is you're streaming us on. That'll, that will do it for us this week. Talk to you guys next week. Peace.